welcome back. Where this is part two of my conversation about Ukraine, Russia, the tensions there. As I say, this in part one, this is a collaboration between the analysis.news and on the barricades. And for analysis viewers, on the barricades is a news and analysis bureau or uh, website a group that does uh, especially focuses on Eastern Europe, but they also have lots of information and understanding of Russia and what's going on in the geopolitics of the world. So once again, joining me is Maria Chernet. She's a graduate of the Faculty of Journalism and Communication Studies at the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Bucharest in Romania, and she also teaches there. And also joining me again is Boyan Stanislavski. He's a Polish and Bulgarian activist and a journalist, and he's also one of the main contributors to the barricade. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. All right. So uh, first of all, if you haven't watched part one, you should, because it will create the context for this, because we're going to kind of pick up the conversation more or less from where we left off. Uh, but let, let me go back to a, a question I asked before, um, which is two things. One is what sparked this now? Why, you know, this has been going on since 2014, this, con this you know, tensions fight over this uh, region, Donbass, which is majority Russian, a lot of, uh, apparently, a lot of the people that live there do want to be actually part of Russia. Uh, now, you mentioned something in the part one. In fact, Russian speaking and Ukrainian speaking uh, peoples lived in Ukraine for all the time of the Soviet Union. And I know it was a repressive state and all that, but that being said, people got along and they got along before there was a Soviet Union. Uh, so the, the, usually when you get these nationalist conflicts behind them are the oligarchs, the ruling elites of these different places. And usually there's money to be made out of this kind of strife, uh, whether it's in terms of war materials uh, or other ways. Um, so so in, in terms of the so that you've got that and then specifically why now what's triggering it? Well, okay, look, in terms of class analysis, as I said, uh, well, it would be a long story probably to explain it now, how it began and how in the, in the beginning of the 90s and how it's playing itself out right now. Uh, but let's just, uh, for the sake of the conversation, let's just point out one, one important thing here that, you know, the question of, of Ukrainian nationalism is vital to the self-orientation, self-definition, self-assertion uh, for the Ukrainian ruling class. I mean, in order to be the Ukrainian ruling class, you had to make it all up. It's like, you know, there are many examples of that in Macedo uh, in, in Eastern Europe, sorry, and uh, n n not least in Macedonia, for example, Northern Macedonia. Now it's called Northern Macedonia. Which, uh, but, but, you know, Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian ruling class, without Ukrainian nationalism and without its Russophobic uh, element, it would have had no reason to really exist that's you know that's that's very problematic and, for them. And, and, and can i and let me add the same thing is more or less true in russia because without russian nationalism people would see through what the all russian oligarchs are doing in russia and, and russian nationalism <clears throat> helps cover that up so you've got somewhat similar things going on on both sides uh, yeah, well, but uh, I, I just want to say that the difference here is that Russia is a, is a state with, with, with very long traditions, okay, it used to be an empire, then it used to be a Soviet Union, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, uh, you know, the Russian state well, is something... Well, okay, well, let me add to that. Mm -hmm. It's true in the United States. Without yeah, Americanism, yes. without yeah. Americanism, and that kind of nationalism, make America great again, whether it's coming from mm -hmm. the Republicans or the Democrats, it plays the same role to cover up what the American oligarchy is. Doing. Okay, so okay, I, look, I, just, I, I, let's... I agree with you that nationalism is often used to just cover up uh, like lack of political progress and lack of social progress and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I just want to say that, in my opinion, the quality of Russian nationalism and quality of Ukrainian nationalism is, is different. But uh, having said that, I just want to go to the to the main point here, is which is the, uh, you know, the oligarchs, in 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 uh, in Ukraine, you know, they for them this ideology is extremely important. Okay, I mean, this is something that uh, allows them to define themselves as the ruling class of a country that is very difficult to manage. Okay, and and it really is. You can see it now. Okay, uh, when particularly when there's uh, there are Western or, or some kind of uh, interests 
uh, powerful interests, okay, global powerful interests involved, then the situation becomes very volatile immediately and we're at the brink of war. Now, <clears throat> why now has this all happened? And, and uh, I would say that this is a continuation of what began in April when I explained in the previous segment that, you know, there was this, uh, uh, th- there was this, this threat, Ukrainian th- uh, threat from the side of Ukraine that they're going to invade uh, the two breakaway republics. They called it, of course, the restoration of the territorial unity and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and then, you know, Russia was really amassing, tr- at that time, they were really amassing troops at the border, okay? That was then a fact, and they were even boasting about it because they wanted to deter Ukraine from doing anything because at the time Ukraine was actually aiming to provoke Russia so that Russia does something that is remotely close to to a hot hot war i don't know fire a few bullets i don't kill someone or something and then they were they were hoping that they would put uh the the nord stream 2 project to a halt that uh, maria referred to earlier it's a pipeline that is going uh through uh the bot uh uh, yes uh, underneath the baltic sea okay and basically, it doesn't go through Poland. It doesn't go through uh, Ukraine. It doesn't go through any countries that are hostile to Russia uh, today. Uh, and uh, yeah, it does play a role. Like I would say that uh, at the bottom of the crisis today, uh, yeah, Nord Stream is is definitely there. But I would say uh, let, me, uh, let me let me let me yeah. let me let me add to that. In the Western press, apparently, one of Biden's threats to Putin is if there is any military conflict, he wants Germany to cancel that Nord Stream 2. Oh, he wanted which would that. Be a, 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 yeah. yeah, which is, yeah, I well, mean, yeah, they've been wanting that anyway. But they, they were barely wanting wanted that, and they were not happens. getting anywhere with this uh, with this demand. And mm-hmm. this is this is one of the things that I think Joe Biden and his administration was extremely irritated about. And, and you know, uh, Angela Merkel, the chancellor, well, now she's not the chancellor anymore. Uh, but she used to be until a couple of uh, days ago. Uh, the Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, was very, uh, very strict about it. That no, we are, uh, we are going through with Nord Stream two, and you know, I don't quite understand why would anyone in America expect any different answer. I mean, maybe the American ruling class is just accustomed to the fact that no one refuses anything when they want something. But in fact, like, you know, people try, like to present, including the American media and the Western European media, like to present the Nord Stream 2 initiative as, as some kind of Russian nefarious, you know, activity trying to undermine the whatever gas security of, of, of Europe and so and so forth. Whereas it's totally not the case. I mean, it's the it was the German initiative. Like the Germans wanted that, not the Russians. And then the Russians agreed to it. And I I would say even that they would not have had agreed had they known what kind of problems uh, this is going to really bring them. But that's again another show. Now uh, to the the current crisis. So I would say that the. B- b- the objectives of of the people concocting this story are uh, three, basically. The first is that they want permission to ship large amounts of arms to Ukraine. And this is what you, Paul, referred to earlier, like NATO, expansion treaties, and stuff like that. I totally uh, agree with this. Uh, and, and as a result of this, this need, this demand, this, this, this desire... Uh, they want the tension, you know, to build in order for the delivery to be, you know, approved politically and 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 so on. Uh, the weapons in question appear to be, uh, I, I would say, those that have been supplied to the former Afghan army. And I'm kind of, you know, I, I'm, it's a speculation here, but I feel that perhaps they were not able to deliver all they had planned to the Afghan army. So now they have to, you know, put it uh, somewhere, sell it somewhere. So, you know, Humvees, helicopters, missiles, uh, Javelin missiles, and, and, and that kind of weapons. Uh, but we're talking about very considerable, considerable shipment. So hundreds of millions of dollars in arms, perhaps even a billion dollars, I don't know, but something in that range. Okay. Uh, although I have to uh, uh, stress that here, whatever they sell, whatever they give, even to the Ukrainian army, it will be insufficient to shift the military balance. That's, uh, I guess, very important also perhaps for our re- uh, readers, oh, sorry, viewers, to uh, to know that, you know, in terms of military force, you know, the Ukrainian army is nothing even remotely comparable 
to the Russian army uh, today, uh, no matter how many Javelin missiles they're going to buy from, uh, from the Americans. Uh, nonetheless, you know, this is one of the reasons, in, uh, in my opinion. The second reason is that uh, I believe they are becoming increasingly concerned, and Maria pointed it out, about Ukraine's political situation, because the economy is, is devastated totally. Uh, it has always been in very bad shape and deteriorating uh, since the beginning of the 90s. But, you know, with the pandemic now, it's it's like in, in ruins. And speculation is growing that, uh, you know, the, uh, this president, Zelensky, uh, his job, like his position could be jeopardized. And... and uh, the oligarchs, uh, because that's that's true. I I mean, Ukraine is is run by uh, some kind of consulate of oligarchs. Really, there was this meeting of Ukrainian, or I think it's still ongoing, uh, Ukrainian oligarchs in Vilnius, uh, the capital of Lithuania, a country north of uh, Ukraine, at the Baltic Sea, close to the Polish border, uh, and they are reportedly planning to actually depose him. Uh, and there has been much speculation about this in the Russian uh, media and in the Ukrainian and Belarusian media. So, yeah, that's definitely uh, the second reason for that crisis uh, to occur now. Uh, and uh, as I said in the beginning, there is concern about Nord Stream 2, uh, Nord, Nord Stream 2 sorry, uh, given that it is expected to be uh, to be certified in, in I think, spring. Uh, yeah, in the spring. And, and that the Russians are absolutely refusing to consider extending gas transit uh, through Ukraine beyond 2024 or 2025. So as a result, I, I believe that the hardliners um, believe now is the time to make one final push to prevent Nord Stream 2 from uh, receiving certification and to bolster support uh, you know, for them, for the West in Ukraine, uh, including Zelensky's own support maybe, uh, as well as, of course, uh, Western European or you know, European, pan-European support for Ukraine. I think the underlying issue here is you've got oligarchs in all the countries involved, and I first and foremost include the Americans, uh, and they all want to get what they can out of the value uh, created out of the Ukrainian people's hard work. And, uh, and the same thing goes for Russia and the United States. Okay, let's just move to some other piece of this. So in the West... Russia is seen as this, uh, and I have to say, this is the underlying narrative of the entire American military industrial complex, which is after the defeat of Hitler, Russia was the next Hitler. And Russia was going to be just like Hitler and want to expand, invade, occupy Western Europe and, and the whole world if they could. Now, we know that was a crock, that the Soviet Union never planned to do that. It was in a defensive posture. Yeah, there was an ideological battle going on. Yeah, the Soviet Union supported national liberation movements. Yeah, the Soviet Union was very repressive internally, domestically. But that being said, the Soviet Union was in no position and had no desire to become the next Hitler and try to occupy everybody. Now, Putin's supposed to want that. And the only thing that holds Russia back from doing that is supposed to be NATO. Now, China's the next one. China's supposed to be the next Hitler on the scene. China wants so many to invade yeah. Asia. Yeah, now China is the only thing. The only thing holding back China from invading Australia is America. I mean, it's nuts, but it is the no. narrative. That being said, what is the narrative in Eastern Europe? Do people see Russia as this imminent threat that they need America and NATO to hold it back? Like, for example, Maria, how is Romania seeing what's going on now in the Ukraine? Well, the Romanians were always very obedient and uh, they took uh, everything that the Western media told them and amplified it. I conducted uh, a research in the summer where there were human interest stories in mainstream U.S. media uh, regarding the Afghan people wanting to depart from Kabul. Now that... I compared it to the titles and how that was reflected in Romanian media. That was 10 times more emotional, 10 times pushing on the pedal of emotions and actually amplifying those messages about how desperate the poor Afghans now are since the Liberation Army of the United States left them 
in the claws of these monsters that are the Taliban. I mean, you should have seen the titles, how bombastic they were, how emotional. So basically in Romania, we had one of the most powerful pro-NATO campaigns, uh, I think in all Eastern Europe, and we were the ones to be the more prone to accept everything. It's like the pro-US church here. And uh, of course, there is a lot of polarization because those who are who oppose that are polarized and you can hardly find like, I, I don't think there are 20 intellectuals in Romania. I've seen this is a optimistic evaluation that could uh, have a very nuanced and balanced perspective on what's going on. And to see beyond these very emotional discourses that the Russians are bad, they destroyed us during the communism because they invaded us, they brought communism, they brought all the ills in the world in Romania, and uh, they are the evil monsters that only the United States can save us from. And this is done on multiple levels, you know. You have mainstream intellectuals uh, whose main job is to write, like every other week, an article against Russia, saying how they are aggressors, how they want to destroy us, how um, only the fact that we are NATO members uh, guarantees our economic and uh, social uh, stability and security. Then you have journalists and then you have televisions that usually run pro-American news. These are the layers. So you have intellectuals, you have journalists and media, whole media that never ran since I watched TV and I watched it for a long period of time being also a media theorist. I never saw, for instance, on Digi Doze that is the television that is right wing and pro NATO and pro US. I never saw a critical article uh, related to, to the US army or whatever. And that speaks to the general feeling uh, in Romania because most of Romanians are very pro-NATO, pro-US. US has a wonderful image still in Romania. And usually <laughs> this works against us in a way that most of the conspiracy theorists tend to be believed because they come from the United States. And since the United States has such a good image, whatever comes from the United States must be good. That's a side effect. So usually I can speak for the situation in Romania that uh, it is rather sad to see Romanian intellectuals embarking with no critical thinking skills at all on this mission of, uh, you know, um, actually promoting U.S. interests in Romania. And I don't know what they're doing. Maybe some of them are really sincere and they're doing out of conviction and maybe other have other interests. I have no way of knowing. But when you look at somebody who publishes, Paul, you're a journalist. Now tell me, you publish every week or every two weeks an article bashing Russia and at the same time, lionizing the United States. Does it seem like something an unusual intellectual will do? It seems so mm -hmm. odd. And there are like four or five people. And whenever there is a question where you have to discuss international politics or international conflicts, like the one we just discussed, there are these people that are gathered usually uh, in the national television and also in this uh, TV channels I mentioned, that they are the ones, they are the authorities. But unfortunately, the authorities, with minor exceptions, are the ones that do as I said. And I find this very interesting. Now, <laughs> now when you say the Mer America has a good image, and there's also a lot of belief in American conspiracy theory, uh, you've got division in the Americans. Uh, the American preponderance of the American government and elites are pro-vaccine, pro-mask, uh, and but you've got significant sections of the Trumpist type forces. Even though Trump himself took credit for developing the vaccine, somehow it's be, he separated himself from that. What's going on in Romania in terms of mask, vaccines, and COVID? 
Well, Romania had a very sad record because for weeks, for weeks, we were number one in the world in terms of COVID-related deaths. I mean, just to give you an example, usually in Romania, on a daily basis, when there is no COVID pandemic or whatever, around 700 people die to say of natural causes, okay? Well, we had days when COVID-related deaths amounted to 600 persons. Just imagine. So it was a huge percentage. And this is why we were number one in the world. And unfortunately, uh, we have 30% of the population vaccinated. I think it, things got a little better now because... Thir uh, thir 30? 30? 30? That must be one of the... 30. But that must, that must be one of the lowest rates anywhere in Europe, for sure. Yes, now it got a little better. But at the time when I'm speaking uh, about Romania being, and it's not very far, it's like a month ago, um, and uh, people started to get vaccinated also because they saw that many people died and we were overwhelmed, overwhelmed. I mean, we were in a situation where we were not able to treat and to, to actually take care of the people that were seriously ill. And um, Hungary actually helped at some point and took some of the patients. The situation was desperate and only 30% of the population got uh, the vaccine. And the conspiracy theories are... Uh, at a level that you would find unimaginable. And now the peculiar thing. Oh, about no, no, I wouldn't. Unimaginable. I mean, I'm in the United States a lot. I, that's, <laughs> the conspiracies can't be worse than there. As you well, were saying, a lot of them you. come from there. Yes. Well, it was actually a very good show on NBC. A, a, um, a journalist um, interviewed one of my colleagues at the university, uh, Alina Borgoano. She uh, is a specialist in di digital disinformation and fake news, and she was interviewed. Uh, and at one point, the journalist said, what, what you are describing, it seems like it comes from here, from the United States. And yes, that is true. It is a very very bizarre thing that is happening in Romania right now because the Russians, at least the pro-Russian uh, media and the pro-Western ones are at odds, of course. But when it comes to vaccines, it is very interesting. You have conspiracy theories. Just today, I received like two movies of two American so-called doctors warning about vaccines and that we are going to die in two years because we got the vaccines. And you know all the uh, things that are being circulated. But... But there are not the pro-Western TV channels that are amplifying the messages, but the pro-Russian ones. Now, the pro-Russian ones are also very peculiar because they are not saying that Russia is great, but actually they say that Vladimir Putin is a great leader. Now, why is he a great leader? Because they project on him a kind of manhood that they aspire to. And they say that he is great because... Uh, gay people have no rights in uh, Russia, that feminists have oh, no geez. rights, and he is authoritarian, and he's the man, and he shows this deviant sex or Marxist, as they call, you know, they call, would call us maybe <laughs> a sex or Marxist. So Putin shows this uh, deviant sex or Marxist, uh, where is their place? And uh, he is uh, getting a hold of things there. He's in control. And this is what they like. This is very crazy. And these are actually the people that are amplifying the conspiracy theories coming from the United States. Now, they are extremely successful, let me tell you, that I feel I am in a minority. And even if you look at the news, because... Uh, there are some TV channels that actually want to inform and provide statistics and information, but there is, we reached the point in Romania where I think we are in a very serious uh, danger. If you come today in Romania with the perfect cure for COVID, I think people would refuse to take it. I mean, the paranoia and the hysteria reached a point of no returning, and I don't see how are we going to go back from that. 
they wanted to impose actually mandatory vaccination. Now I'm telling you, you can do that when you have like 80% vaccinated, but when the percentage is the other way around, you have like 30, 40% of people vaccinated and the other 60% are not. You cannot do something like that because everybody will go berserk and everything will explode in your face. I don't believe that. By the way, you don't just, believe? I don't believe that. I don't believe that the Romanians or the Polish would go on the barricades because someone would order a mandatory Oh, but they will. But they yeah, will. Okay. I, it's impossible. It's just bottom separate on my end. I don't do believe that. How do you force with, with 30% All right, well, well, right. Well, let me. All right. Well, well <laughs> let's switch. Let's. Well, just before we run out of time, let's. Let's go back to the main theme, and then I'll ask you a COVID right. question. But in, in Poland and Bulgaria, which are two right. very different places, but given that you you wear both hats, I'll wrap the question together. To what extent do ordinary Poles, ordinary Bulgarians see that this Russia is this imminent threat they need NATO Americans to protect them from? Not many. In, uh, like not many people in Poland or in Bulgaria believe that uh, NATO will protect them from uh, from Russia successfully. I think many people uh, do believe in Poland in particular do believe that Poland should incline itself with the West, that Poland should be aspire to become part of the Western hemisphere or the Western culture of the Western model, and so on and so on. And America is viewed still as. Uh, the kind of the political, the moral, and the cultural leader of the West, and uh, yeah, God, don't they don't they have news shows? Yeah, that well, think? that's that's the problem. But no, no, but but no, no. Look, this is precisely the problem. I mean, we are up against. You know, an enormous propaganda machine. Okay, so uh, despite like people don't know that in America there are you know places that are totally devastated, people who live on the street, and and I don't know who earn two dollars per hour or something like that. Okay, and I uh, just weigh in to say something that Paul, I believed that, I believe that when I went to United to the United States for the first time and I saw so many poor people, I was shocked. I was shocked because I used to think, oh, this is propaganda. Everybody must be doing well here. So I believed it. <laughs> and when I saw so many poor people, I was, oh, this is true. They were not lying to us. And I see like hundreds. I kid you not. I was in San Francisco that there were hundreds of homeless people at the entrance of a park. And I was devastated. I could not believe it. I mean, and I, I'm telling it to, to my family and to friends here, and they do not believe it either, just to see the power of propaganda. Yeah, I mean, I found that when I used to travel in Eastern Europe, when it was still part of the Soviet Union, uh, I, oh, Soviet I used to hear that all. Part of the Soviet, Soviet Union. Soviet bloc, yeah. yeah. Soviet, Soviet bloc, yeah. And uh, I used to hear that, and I used to say, you know, <laughs> you don't know. And they, but yeah. they so disbelieved the BS coming from their own governments, they thought it must be paradise in the West. Uh, and yes, I'm, yes, I'm a little yes. surprised they still, they still think so. All right, let me, let me, boy, and let me just rephrase my question. I get Poles want to be in part of the West and they, and they also don't think NATO would ever really defend them. That being said, do they actually see Russia as a threat in, in any military way? I think many people, a large part of the public opinion does, but this is not a genuine analysis on their part. This is definitely, you know, the effect of the of the propaganda. And, you know, what Maria described, despite the fact that it's, it, it just sounds and looks ludicrous on its face, but that's the case. This is how things are here. Like from, you know, from early morning till or late evening, you are being bombarded all the time. Okay, about how uh, you know Russia is an imminent threat, how they are one, how they want to actually, well, as you said, actually in the beginning of the previous segment, that they want to be the Hitler, they want to be the, uh, you know, they want to occupy Western Europe, Eastern Europe, the whole world, like the Antarctica, everything, right? Uh, so this is this is pretty much the, the the picture that they draw, and they do that very effectively because you know they use all those uh, you know PR techniques and so on and so forth, so they do know how to spark fear. 
and and this fear pornography so to say it has been you know the it, it was the essence the central point the central part of our uh, everything here of our everyday life that russia's coming russia's coming and you know i've been here waiting for i don't know how many years now for the russian tanks to come and i have never seen one and there is no indication whatsoever rationally speaking there's no indication that russia wants to i don't know rebuild the warsaw pact for example Okay, by the you know, by the way, the, the the alliance between Russia and China right now makes the two countries much more powerful than the Soviet Union ever was with their uh, Warsaw Pact. By the way, but that's again, that's just a, a digression. So uh, you know, this this there is uh, uh, there is a lot of fear in the society, but this fear, this particular one against Russia or towards Russia, is absolutely artificial there's a lot of fear that uh, that is natural and genuine which comes uh, stems out from uh, the problems that have accumulated over the, the, the last 30 years of capitalist restoration there's a lot of anxiety there's a lot of fear uh, but it's related to the uh, to, to, to you know to the everyday economic struggles of the people okay and all other pathologies that of course uh, follow you know poverty and 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 you know and destitution so uh, I would say that in Poland more but in Bulgaria for example I would say that it's it's almost non-existent I mean there's no there's no concept of Russian threat that is really popular in the society because the uh, the Bulgarian society unlike the Polish society is uh, is is, is is I mean looks towards Russia or looks towards Moscow with some uh, I would say uh, I don't know sentiment okay and and uh, they they view Russians as as a brotherly nation and it's not only them of course I would say that uh, well Romania is a bit of an exception here <clears throat> but in general I would say that the 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 Orthodox bow so to say like you know the which is uh, uh, Moscow, Minsk, the, the, the capital city of Belarus, then Kiev, the capital city of Ukraine, then, uh, you know, Moldova, Kishinev, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, you know, those countries in general, historically speaking, not right now, were always close to Russia in, you know, culturally and civilizationally, even if you like. Okay, so Moscow was a has always been a natural metropolis for those uh, nations, for those societies, for those countries, for those elites, and uh, you know in. In Bulgaria, uh, this sentiment is particularly strong, and I could go into into why there are many nuances here. Uh, but it's it's particularly strong, and in Bulgaria, no one believes that that Russia will come. On the contrary, I would say that many would welcome you know <laughs> Russia doing something. And for a long period of time, by the way, uh, I, I would say, yeah, last fifteen years maybe, a large segment of the Bulgarian society was hoping. That Russia would do something like, you know, build uh, another version of Warsaw Pact or something, and that the Bulgarians could join, and that finally we'd have some life. You know, we'd get we'd get a life after these years of, of disaster. Uh, but of course, that never happened, despite the fact that there were even attempts on the part of the Bulgarian ruling class to form a pro-Russian, obviously pro-Russian, sometimes in a comical manner, even pro-Russian parties, and they never really got any support from Russia because Russia's just not. Really, I mean, the current Ru Russian uh, uh, priorities are not really Bulgaria or, or I don't know, anything uh, so much in Europe. It's just that Ukraine, in Ukraine, they don't want NATO there. It's a matter of national security. That's why they're doing all this. That's why they, 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 they allowed the process and they accepted Crimea. Uh, after the referendum and the voting in the parliament, in the local parliament, to become part of the Russian Federation, because had they not, had this not happened, Crimea would today be a NATO base, and they, they, they just couldn't. You know, they, they be they be they being the Russians. Yeah, they being the Russians. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, that 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 just was uh, the logical effect, okay, of what the Americans were doing uh, in uh, in Ukraine and what culminated in this Maidan revolution of dignity or whatever or coup, fascist coup, as some say, as I said. Oh, yeah. I have to okay. go here and tell right. you a very very funny story, you know, regarding Russia and how they were supposed to protect us, NATO, and how they are supposed to protect us from Russia. And this funny story goes like this: Romanian gangsters were able to steal gas from a military base in Romania. And they say the American authorities um, send information to the, the American authorities send information to Romanian authorities saying that the gas uh, were worth uh, $2 million. That much was steal. Because they would go in in the military ba base with 
tanks to feed the generators with diesel, but they would not put all the gas in the generators. They would always take some for them. And that process continued for a long time. So you see, it is very interesting here that basically NATO is supposed to protect us from Russia, but they can protect us from our own gangsters. That is something to be, you know, discussed and thought about. Right. I just want to add that uh, some years ago, when the first uh, NATO bases were opened in Bulgaria, some uh, French parachuters, which were drilling somewhere in the Bulgarian mountains, they landed in the wrong village, I mean, in the wrong place, and they didn't know where they are, they did not speak Bulgarian, and in the aftermath, they got beaten up by the locals, because the locals did not know who they are. And so, yeah, th th those sort of things happen, and I don't believe uh, that, you know... Uh, yeah, NATO would really engage in any kind of war with Russia. But for the end, for the very end, and, and you know, sort of closing, uh, one closing remark, which I really find is, very, uh, I feel is very important, is uh, because we didn't mention that, and it's very important, I think, the beginning of the story, like how how the, the, the current hysteria about this alleged Russian aggression, imminent Russian aggression started. You know, I took uh, took the time, investigated, okay, how it, how it started, and it all started r relatively recently, really. I mean, it, you know, you, you get this impression that uh, uh, this hysteria has been with us for uh, um, months now, but no, it actually started a couple of weeks ago with uh, uh, anonymous officials leaking information to the Washington Post, and I think Politico, claiming that Russia was, you know, massing troops on, on the border. And what is funny, what is funny here is that the Pentagon responded by claiming that there had, had been no unusual activity on, the, on you know, this Russian-Ukraine border. And, and even Ukraine, the Ukrainian authorities, they have also stated that there will, uh, that there, they, there is no unusual military activity observed on the border. And, and it's then that those anonymous source, sources, uh, you know, they continued to claim that the troops were uh, massing on the border. And eventually, after a while, everyone uh, fell, you know, in, in, into line. So uh, that's why I, I, I had this, um, I, I, I offered this speculation that I think it must be the hardliners in Washington uh, just trying to, uh, to instigate something that is just not there. These issues usually are, if you want to understand geopolitics, uh, the first thing you have to understand is domestic politics, because so much of what gets done is driven by, first of all, money making in terms of the arms manufacturers, and then two, domestic politics. And Biden just cannot afford, especially he's really down in the polls, he cannot afford to be accused of being, quote unquote, weak on Russia or weak on China. And this kind of nationalist Cold War uh, rhetoric and positioning uh, is seen as some way to bolster him in the polls. Uh, and, and so it's not just the hardline neocons. Okay. Uh, it's, it's an old song in, in the U.S. Uh, that these kinds of points of tension are, are seen to be good for presidents. At, at least the reverse, that if you're accused of being weak, it's certainly bad for you. Uh, and under, these are complicated processes, and it's not and it's not entirely like the people in the institutions themselves don't believe their own bullshit. Uh, you know, the, these people that have been brought up in the Pentagon, brought up in the American state in the uh, you know, brought up in the American political culture, uh, their identities are all wrapped up in this stuff. And, uh, and and so to a large extent, you know, it's convenient to believe this stuff, and so they do believe this stuff. Uh, but we can we get an all into that more in another session. Uh, Maria Boyan, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank for you. And, yes. uh, and we'll we'll do this more regularly. I think it's very interesting. And thank you for joining us on the barricade and joining us on the analysis. And we'll see you again.